everybody. We're a little bit late. I'll be honest, this is a little weird without a, a co-host here. Um, but everybody's feedback last time was really, really good. Um, and it seemed as though um, you guys enjoyed it. So with a few requests for some more videos, we're going to do um, a series of like 20 minute long videos. Um, you better time me because I could do this for hours. Anybody that you've ever met me in person knows that there's no stop in this freight train. Um, <laughs> um, so uh, we've had a, I've had a few requests for things that people would like to talk about. Um, so we're going to start at the beginning. Um, and it's not really the beginning. Nobody really knows when the beginning is really um, of the incandescent light bulb. Um, but we're going to start with the, the road to the first successful uh, systems. Um, We'll set aside the Edison versus Swan um, discussion for another uh, presentation where we talk about uh, Joseph Swan. Uh, but we're going to go with the, the view that Edison had the first successful system of electric lighting. Um, so Edison picked up where other people had left off. He really didn't invent the idea of the incandescent lamp. Um, those before him uh, had started with platinum as a filament. And it was thought that platinum had one of the higher melting temperatures of, of most metals, um, so that platinum would be um, successful and sustain incandescence when, when illuminated between a short. Um, so in this article here in Scientific American, there are really very few surviving um, Edison platinum burners. Um, the only known examples are from the Hammer Collection and are at... Um, uh, either at Dearborn Village, uh, I'm sorry, uh, not Greenfield Village in Dearborn, but uh, in the Henry Ford Museum, right uh, next door, um, or the Edison National Historic Site. We're not sure exactly where they are. Um, but this uses a regulating system, which would cut and break the current based on the temperature of the filament. So they really didn't find that platinum sustained incandescence um, without overheating and breaking. Um, at this point. The other issue at this point was they really didn't understand that they needed a substantial vacuum. Um, and the vacuum in, in this lamp is, is either non-existent or very minimal. Um, later on, they, they did indeed find that platinum would work to a small extent for, for smaller bulbs with a high vacuum. Um, so Edison um, incorporated his electric light company with uh, with the help of several investors, including J.P. Morgan. Um, Edison was really, really good at um, uh, securing other people's money um, to perform his experiments. Uh, he had become famous uh, for the invention of the phonograph at Menlo Park, uh, which really didn't take much of an investment. Uh, the electric lighting system was, was millions of dollars to, to, to produce, which at that time was, was a substantial amount. I shouldn't say millions of dollars. The original capital stock was 300,000, but eventually spent millions. Um, this is an interesting piece in that, zoom in on there, on that seal. So this from the Ward Harris collection, so we know that this came from one of Edison's associates, um, is the first seal for the Edison Electric Light Company. Um, to my knowledge, I don't know that this exists anywhere else. And, and one thing you'll notice that's interesting about this is in the center, uh, they show an image of a light bulb. It doesn't look like anything that Edison ever made or anybody ever made. Um, but really at this time, uh, it was unknown uh, what the final product would look like. So this seal was probably stamped around 1879. Um, if you zoom out a little bit, this photograph is an original photograph. Unfortunately, we need a little restoration work here. Somebody. In past, um, a long, long time ago, applied some uh, clear tape to it, a practice that we since uh, understood was not a very good idea for, for any uh, ephemeral items. But um, this is an original uh, photograph from Menlo Park about the time of Edison working on the light bulb. Uh, we don't really have anything to point with. Um, right there is, is, is Edison himself with the hat on. So, um, with that, we'll, uh, we'll put some of this paperwork aside. We'll, we can discuss this because this is about the era that we're starting with. So this is an interesting piece. Um, interestingly enough, um, you can get that without glare. Yeah, that's pretty good. 
At Menlo Park, they, uh, they developed photographs from glass negatives as well as made essentially early photocopies, not with Edison's electric pen, but using sunlight um, or light and a, they call this a cyanotype, which is, uh, some of you may have used this like an arts and crafts class where you put objects on top and uh, when exposed to light, it creates um, a, a positive. Um, so this is a document that did exist and it was at the Menlo Park Laboratory. Um, and what they would do in this case, this particular one done by Charles Clark, is they would copy one side so the original of this does exist somewhere. Um, and then on the back side, uh, you could see your original manuscript from March of 1880, um, recording the uh, experiments done and the performance mainly of the first uh, Edison uh, successful filament made of carbonized Bristol board. Um, he then notated later in his career what this, uh, what this document was. So People want to know how old he was. Um, how old he was when he invented the light bulb around this time. So Edison would have been around 32 years old at this point. So uh, 1847 minus 1879. Yeah, uh, what, 32 years old. Yeah, pretty, pretty amazing. So let's, uh, let's go over to some light bulbs. Um, some of this paperwork is a little bit later. Let's not skip ahead with that. We've, uh, taking some stuff out in, in, a, in a place where we can put it safely. Um, so after the platinum burner, Edison um, had the idea that, that uh, carbon was, was a, a viable filament that would have a very, very high melting point um, and realized that if you starved the filament of oxygen, uh, it wouldn't burn as easily um, or burn out as easily. Um, Famously, on October 21st, 1879, uh, they first tested a lamp made of carbonized sewing thread. Uh, that lamp, they say, burned for 40 hours. That's disputed. Um, it's also said that the lamp was, uh, they increased the voltage to see if it would get brighter, at which point it um, expired. Uh, that original light bulb was destroyed uh, for research purposes at the time. In the late 1920s, uh, Fran right? uh, Francis Yale, along with Henry Ford, and in some cases with Edison, uh, made replicas of that first uh, successful lamp. And while there is no proof, this is uh, identical to all known examples that they had made, including one uh, on the Golden Jubilee uh, in 1929 um, of the first lamp. So not an original, but um, about as close of a replica as you would get. Um, we talked earlier about um, platinum filaments. So there are no platinum filament burners in any private collection. Um, however, this from the Hammer Collection is a platinum filament Edison lamp. Uh, this is an interesting piece in that this was made in June of 1881. And there was a famous balloonist, I don't remember his name, uh, who uh, had requested of Edison uh, a means of illuminating the basket from his hot air balloon. And uh, Edison instructed the letters of direction still, or directing still, uh, I'm sorry. Edison instructed Francis Upton to make a small quantities of lamps for use on batteries of platinum filaments. That letter still survives at the Edison National Historic Site. And this is the only surviving um, example from that um, experimental flight using a platinum, coiled platinum filament bulb. Um, so from, let me grab one other thing, just stand there one second. So, from cotton thread, which was highly um, impractical, the, the next material that Edison used with some success was carbonized paper. And this was referred to as Bristol board, which was a similar to like a manila folder type of material that would have been cut with a set of dyes and carbonized. Um, 
this particular example uh, dates to early 1880. You can see the remains of the paper uh, filament right there. Um, interestingly about this lamp is by the time this lamp was made, um, this type of clamp, which was experimental for a very short period of time, this type of clamp was um, already replaced with the platinum vice clamp, which we'll see right here. However, there is a patent from November of 1879 showing this spring clamp, which has spring steel, brass heat radiators, one of them's broken off here, and platinum pl pads to grip the filament. Um, this clamp was used for a very brief period of time. To my knowledge, no other examples of Edison lamps with that early clamp exist. And what's interesting is these clamps were certainly reused. These were not original to this bulb when it was made. They would have been recycled at the laboratory uh, just because there was no reason to, to, to not use them from a bulb that had failed. They would have cracked it open, saved the clamps, and, and recycled them from work about two, three months prior. Um, we'll put this back in its home just for safety. All right, so paper had its issues. Um, paper was inconsistent in its um, makeup. Uh, areas where the pulp was thinner would, would cause areas that would pr produce higher resistance and would ultimately burn out prematurely. They were extremely fragile and difficult to make and transporting them was nearly impossible. Uh, the, the paper filament lamp was used at Menlo Park and was also used on the first Edison installation on the SS Columbia. Um, in early 1880. Uh, other than that, they were never used in any commercial installation. Um, so from there, Edison knew he needed a filament material that would be more robust and look to plant fibers that would have a grain pattern to them that would be very linear and tight. And um, sent scouts all over the world for all different, to recover all sorts of different vegetable fibers. There were people who went to other countries, contract, contacted diseases that, uh, that they weren't immune to and died on these searches. Um, and ultimately, Edison found a species of bamboo called Madaka from Iwata, Japan, which worked perfectly. Um, the very first versions of these bulbs did not have any form of base. They would have simply just had the glass here with a cork in the center and the wires coming into um, some copper contacts on either side, and they would have press fit into a socket. Um, that worked well when the lamp was in an upright position, but if you wanted to turn it upside down in a fixture, of course, it would fall out. So they knew they needed some sort of securing method. Now, there's some folklore to this where there's a story of Edison and his guys sitting in Menlo Park and staring at a kerosene can, and uh, Edison says something like, uh, you know, well, that there would make a, he wasn't a hillbilly, he didn't say it like that. He goes, that would make a bang up base for a light bulb. Um, I guess bang up was a slang term of the era. Um, but the, this is the first type of screw base fitted to an Edison lamp. The threads are that of a kerosene can. Uh, the socket would have used the opposite, made from the lid of the kerosene can. This is turned out of wood. Um, and these lamps were only used at Menlo Park. Um, this is often referred to as the first commercial lamp. It's really not accurate. Um, this is really very much a prototype, being that the, proto that the Menlo Park um, campus was a prototype for the Edison Electric System. These never actually made it into um, any installations uh, outside of Menlo Park. Um, so this next piece, let me grab a document. Never mind, I didn't pull out that document. No. Oh. All right. 
right, so this is an interesting document, uh, of course, much later than this light bulb. Um, but in 1912, all of the, I'm sorry, 1919, all of the Edison pioneers wrote to Edison describing their experiences working for Edison in the early days. Most of them, um, or most of these letters describe work around electric lighting. And this is Frank Wardlow's letter, um, who later became the president of the Edison pioneers. What's interesting is he discusses starting work for Edison um, while running lines for the Pearl Street Station, which was the first central station for electric lighting. And they discuss using lamps where, um, uh, so men could see to lay tubes at night. Uh, da, 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 da. Um, sorry, a little unprepared. Okay, so they're describing using a small uh, 60 light dynamo um, to send power over the main lines that they've run so far. And then they discuss connecting temporary lamps uh, in the setup of, or in the, in, in, in the, in the, at night so they could illuminate their work. Uh, it discusses that these lamps had no bases, the copper wires from the filament being simply twisted around two mains. So one can only wonder, I'll go back to that, if this particular example was one of those bulbs. It is, it is slightly used. You can see some darkening here. Um, so you can see some darkening here. It, it has been used. Um, however, it was never based. The leading wires are complete and it never had a base. However, this lamp is from an era that Edison lamps would have had bases. So, um, uh, interesting uh, piece. Definitely experimental from, from Edison's use. This came uh, through Dr. Hicks. Another person, um, uh, had, another collector had asked that we do a um, discussion of Dr. Hicks's collection and later we'll do a discussion of uh, sort of the history of light bulb collecting and we'll, we'll go into there. But a lot of Dr. Hicks's uh, light bulbs came from uh, Princeton University uh, when a professor there passed away, Princeton received those lamps from Edison. So we know somewhat of the lineage of this piece uh, and know that it to be um, for experimental use. Um, the wood base was extremely uh, complex to make. They had to salvage threads from other sources. Not sure if they absolutely always use them from kerosene cans. They probably purchased them alone, but uh, it, was, it was a complex piece to make. Um, the next form of base is, is there two minutes left? Mm -hmm. Oh God, two minutes left. Wow, we're going longer than 20 minutes. Sorry guys. Um, <laughs> so the next form of base was, is referred to as the Johnson bevel ring. Um, the Johnson bevel ring was designed by Edward Johnson. In this design, the threads are the center contact and the second contact is an outer ring. Um, this design came out in early 1880, and the problem with it was when you would screw this in, the pressure of the socket would press against the beveled ring and cause the plaster to crack. Uh, this didn't last long. These were used on, on the first Edison installations. Uh, that design was quickly replaced after about six months, and by mid-18, we're out of order here, by mid 1881, they relocated the center contact to the bottom, or the second contact to the bottom, and made the threads larger. Um, they retained the plaster neck. It really is just sort of a carryover from the previous design. It didn't really serve any purpose, uh, perhaps other than a handle to screw the bulb in, um, but it, it did stick around for a little bit. Um, one thing that's interesting to note, we'll go to this piece right here. Um, there is, there are a few examples of earlier Edison lamps. You'll see the platinum clamps there that were used in the, the mid part of 1880, the early to mid part of, early to later part of 1880, um, in bases that are later, either in the short thread that we'll discuss in a bit, or the plaster collar base. Um, 
why do these exist? They would have never gone back to uh, platinum clamps, which we should discuss the filament attachment method uh, in a second. They would have never uh, gone back to platinum clamps in 1881. Why do those bulbs exist? Well, there is a letter um, that survives that discusses the ability with the design of the new base to make use of lamps which had a fatter knack, neck that would have fit in the wood base Edison, but would not fit in the Johnson bevel ring Edison. And uh, that original correspondence between Francis Upton and Edison and Charles Batchelor still exists to this day um, at the Edison National Historic Site through the Edison Papers Project, um, explaining that they were doing that and they were happy to make use of those lamps and a few examples survive today. So the next step was the removal of the plaster ring. It served no purpose. So they got rid of it. Um, we'll talk for a little bit about the filament attachment because we skipped on that. So the first successful lamps used a vice clamp made of platinum. Later, uh, they made them out of nickel. And this is, has a small screw. And the more you tighten it, the, it's essentially a vice. Problem with this was A, it was extremely expensive and complex to make, but B, too tight and it would fracture the fragile carbonized filament. Too loose, the filament could fall out or build up high resistance and cause an arc, which there are examples where there was an arc and the platinum has uh, vaporized essentially and coated the inside of the bulb. Um, by late 1880, they were working on methods to attach the filament in a less expensive, less time consuming fashion. And by early 1881, they used a process of copper plating where they took copper wire, rolled it flat, bent it over itself, pressed the filament in place, and then had an apparatus that would um, uh, apply copper plating. Um, unfortunately, don't have the drawing of that prepared, but of how that worked um, to the filament, securing it in place. Um, so that was used until about 1886. Um, so, um, this lamp here dates to between 1883 and 1885. Uh, one thing about dates, people throughout the history of collecting have put dates on things as if pieces were made from January 1884 to December 1884. Uh, it didn't work that way. There was a lot of crossover. Uh, the ring certainly, the plaster ring certainly went away um, by um, um, 1883. Um, so the next step was further improving or, or um, simplifying the filament attachment. So this is about 1886. We still have this shorter thread on the base, but still fits a, a modern socket. Um, and the filament is attached with uh, small globs of a carbon paste. So it was basically a, carb uh, a carbon powder or powdered carbon and um, like lamp black and uh, a mixture of sugar water. Uh, from there, uh, the base got longer with longer threads. Um, we'll let's skip over this because these are all kind of minimal. This is an interesting piece here, just of note. Um, very few Edison lamps made by Edison had bases other than Edison bases. Um, anything that you see that has uh, a, an Edison lamp with a, with a non-Edison base is most likely, or really is, a General Electric product. Um, this was a base that Edison made that would fit other lamps. And it is designed to fit in, as it's sitting now, a Westinghouse base or an Edison base. And if you take out this little adapter, it would then also fit in a Thompson Houston base. Really uh, unusual. There's a patent for it, there are advertisements for it, but you rarely see them. Um, we'll talk about one other point and then we'll, we'll wrap this up. Um, this is an interesting piece just to show sort of the history of what eventually came of, of, of the industry by the early 1890s. Um, Edison was suing the majority of his competitors by the mid 1880s. Um, they had infringed on his patents and basically 
uh, stole his concept of, of his successful lamp, which consisted of a uh, fully sealed glass envelope, a carbonized high resistance filament um, with platinum wires entering into the stem seal. Um, once he found success, starting with Hiram Maxim and others to follow, that basic design was simply copied with small changes that really didn't actually uh, improve upon Edison's patent um, were manufactured. Um, by 1891-ish, two, um, Edison won his court case. Um, by the time he won, it was really uh, General Electric by 1892. Um, what's interesting about this piece is this is an Edison lamp. Um, however, how did they catch the wood bases from catching on fire? We have questions. Sorry for not answering the questions. Um, Aunt Joanne, shout out. Uh, the lamps didn't produce any more, any more heat than a modern light bulb, modern incandescent light bulb would. Um, so there, there really was no heat. There was no open flame, and it wasn't hot enough to um, make contact with the wood. Uh, or, or enough heat to, to ignite the wood. Uh, one point though about wood is wood is, uh, can absorb water and water conducts electricity. So uh, they quickly found out, well, it took them about 10 years in the industry to find out that um, wood was not a good insulator for anything in an electric lighting system because it, it could become minorly conductive. Um, so this is interesting. Once, once the patent infringement case was won, and many, many companies were shut down from manufacturing, several of those companies put out advertisements stating that they would buy back Edison light bulbs and they would rebuild them. And this is an interesting example where you can see at this red line, this lamp was cracked open, the filament replaced with a non-Edison filament, the tip would have been uh, scored and broken off and a new exhaust tube attached a new filament installed. The red is actually a glass used to fuse the two pieces back together, and this lamp was recycled. Uh, so, just just an example. Uh, we'll talk about the patent infringement cases in another example in another video. Um, but this is an example of the extremes uh, some of Edison's comp Edison's competitors went through just to survive uh, until they could once again produce the Edison style light bulb, of which the uh, patents expired. Uh, in 1894. Um, so with that, uh, hold on. We're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much. Um, let me go back here for a second. Um, just one other cool thing, and I really like this stuff. Um, this just shows you what Edison was against, well, up against. Um, Edison was going up against a major uh, industry for, for lighting at the time, which was the gas industry. Um, and a lot of propaganda was put out in many cases by the gas industry to scare people into, sorry about the glare, to scare people uh, away from buying into electric lighting. Um, and these things just kind of, uh, I find these really interesting. An unrestrained demon, uh, and you can see the light bulb and, and, and the linesman there dying, uh, of electric shock and, and everybody else is dying too, the horse and, and that guy. Um, uh, in the end though, he won. Um, amazing to think that, that the fear that this was evoking was encouraging people to use open flame gas lights, which would cause uh, carbon monoxide asphy asphyxiation if not properly, uh, or if, or if, uh, if it leaked. Um, in this case, uh, this was scaring people uh, from, from the idea of running underground conduit, and uh, they just pick the, the horse running along and all of a sudden getting um, uh, electrocuted. So kind of interesting period propaganda. Um, so. All right, so we're gonna wrap it up. We'll do this again soon, and uh, hope you all enjoyed. Thank you.